Hello and welcome to the Eclecticist Podcast. What is the Eclecticist Podcast? Well, it's an investigation of everything from a very British perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal chaps and we're doing this one topic at a time. Nothing is out of bounds. We effectively choose a topic of interest, spend a little time researching it, as little as possible, have a discussion about it, and then we publish the notes. Why are we doing this? Well, the main benefit is to foster a greater understanding of the world before we all ultimately die, and to hopefully prompt further thought and discussion on the topics that we discuss. We are Benjamin De Campos, a designer and believer. Hello. And myself, Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and generally a devil's advocate. Today, we're talking about Apple Incorporated and more specifically, Apple's design. Apple Incorporated is a Californian computer hardware and software manufacturer founded in 1976. It produces higher-end computing products, including desktop and laptop PCs, mobile phones, and portable music players, along with an exclusive spectrum of software. Having experienced highs and lows throughout its lifetime, design has remained its principal attribute and core motivator. Today, it is the world's most valuable company in terms of market capitalization, at least, and responsible for much of the excitement and innovation in the tech world. In this show, we will discuss Apple design, its influence and effect, completely from our point of view. I'd like to start off with just uh, a little sentence I found in the 2012 10K form that uh, I think uh, most large companies in America at least need to publish. It says here, the company designs, manufactures, and markets mobile communication and media devices, personal computers, and portable digital music players, and sells a variety of related software, services, peripherals, networking solutions, and third-party digital content and applications. That's what Apple considers themselves to produce for the world. Um, there are links in the show notes. Um, we are not going to talk about Windows and Microsoft and all of the religious wars or the derivation of a lot of the technologies that Apple incorporate uh, from Park, Xerox, for example. Uh, we're not going to talk about the financial aspects of the Apple Corporation. Uh, we're not particularly going to focus on the hardware technology, although that is quite a driver in terms of design. And we're not going to talk about the manufacturing politics, or rather the politics of manufacturing. But what we are going to talk about is design. I thought we'd start off with defining design. What is good design? Well, maybe before we should start, um, we should probably uh, talk about our own experiences with Apple. Because I think one of us might be a little bit more pro-Apple in general. That's than the you. Other. Yes. I, as a designer, I've used Apple products for all of my professional life. Um, and I have been a bit of an Apple fanboy um, in my earlier years, back in the beige days. Um, less so now. I don't know whether or not that's because they're now much more popular. Who knows? Was that uh, before your color change or Apple's color change? Um, I can just about remember the beige Macs. I think I remember the all-in-one units, uh, which incorporated televisions. The Power Max, perhaps, but they were single units, and they had television infrared remote controls. Well, that was only one line of Macs called the Performers. Uh, the beige Macs lasted right up until the end of the 90s. I think the first iMac came out in 97 or 98, I'm not sure, I can't remember. I do remember the fanfare, Bondi Blue. It was at a time when Apple themselves were very much uh, um, kind of, I'm not really sure, almost like a laughing stock, I think. Uh, was that ever true? Yeah, it definitely was. Well, not laughing stock as such, but they were kind of derided. Um, you know, there, there were websites, IHateApple.com and all the rest the of The religious them, wars. Which we're not going to talk about. Which we are not going to talk about. No, but, but I think absolutely it was very real. No, but I think it's worth mentioning because I think it's to do with Apple's attention to detail um, and their focus on design, good design, which um, in many ways um, was a part of... Uh, bringing them back from the abyss. So what is good design? I mean, Apple apart, how would you define good design? Because it, it always seemed to me to be quite um, 
ethereal when I hear people trying to define what good design is. I, th I can never quite get a complete grasp on what they mean when they say it. I mean, my personal take is design that I enjoy using. So if it's something that I enjoy using in and of itself, despite what it might be producing, I would say that that definitely contributes to what I would imagine good design is. Well, and even that was quite a diaphanous sort of yeah definition. Um, well, I mean, good design. I think. Well, in terms of Apple, good design is attention to detail, um, ease of use, um, and aesthetics come into it. Surely. Uh, I think but I mean, just generally, not in terms of Apple, but just generally. Well, I think generally, um, I like to think good design is like, um, what do they say? Typographers sometimes talk about uh, a font in a book. If you're reading a book and you don't notice the font, the font is brilliant. It's a very well-designed font because you're not distracted. And I think the same with design. Maybe you don't notice design when you're using the product um, to its full extent. So, so invisibility. I mean, of course yeah. we have... Yeah, uh, yeah, good design is invisible. There you go. Well, That's there probably you go. something Dieter Rams would have said. In fact, I think he did. He did. Dieter Rams, <laughs> uh, who was a German industrial designer. Again, we'll come back to what industrial design means. But he worked for the Braun Company, which produces a lot of electrical goods. And he developed 10 points uh, for good design. And I think it's easy to agree with them. And the list is innovative, innovative or innovation... Uh, or rather, a well-designed product must be innovative, useful, aesthetic, understandable, unobtrusive. So that's our that's invisibility. Yeah. Honest. That's a weird so one. So not hiding anything. Oh, I see. Okay. Long-lasting, something that will last as long as whatever the device is. Yeah, that's a weird one. That falls off many lists, I think. Possibly. Consistent. So, Actually, go, so consistency go, all the way through. Long-lasting, we definitely need to talk about when it comes to Apple products. No, indeed. Environmentally friendly, which is, hmm, that sounds like an afterthought, but I suppose. And minimal. So nothing extraneous, nothing unnecessary. No applique or, or unnecessary veneer, I suppose. Well, um, there is another little uh, thing that I always keep, I always bear in mind as a designer um, when I'm designing I'm a graphic designer, I should say. Um, and I always think when there's not, you can't take anything else away from it. Maybe irreducibly complex, I'm not sure. When you can't, you, you've stripped something down to its, its most important features and the last thing you've taken away, the last thing to be taken away, you've taken away. Oh, I don't really know where I'm going with that. But you, you get what I'm saying. But what is the limitation there? So if you reduce something to what? Its functionality or its aesthetic the smallest possible aesthetic pleasure? Or what is the bottom threshold for reducing something to its... I mean, for instance, if you wanted to reduce a potato masher down to its absolute minimum amount of functionality, functional contribution, then you would dispose of any kind of aesthetic consideration. But by doing so, would you compromise the overall sense of good design? Or... Well, it's a balance, I think. Um, and I think it's a balance that Apple tend to get get right. Um, I think it's important that they, the objects um, tap into our sense of the numinescence to introduce uh -huh. that element into this. I think it needs to have some special um, X factor. There's probably a better term, uh, but I can't think of what it is. I think it needs to be. It needs to have style. Now, style is another loose. Well, word. yes, indeed. But I think I think what you're saying is. There is a balance that needs to be struck, and the people who are able to most successfully strike that balance are designers by definition. So it's a case of just making it work. So what I'm saying is that there is not a, an algorithm or a formula as such, but there, there are a set of rules, and those with the wisdom to wield those rules in the most successful way produce the most successful design. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, but also there's there's a level of compromise as well. I mean, Apple are able to execute these amazing designs um, within the constraints, the technological constraints uh, which they have. Um, and I guess that's also part of their skill, I think. Well, I've often thought that 
they are constrained by the available technology, and I think they they use that constraint to drive a lot of their design. Or like, well, I'm jumping ahead here, but I would I, I immediately think of the desktop computers. Uh, they started off with cathode ray tubes, and then they developed into flat screens. And for a designer, a the three dimensional aspect of a cathode ray tube versus a two dimensional flat screen are push you down radically different design paths, I would have thought. And I think that's evident in the evolution of the iMac, which we will talk about later in the hardware section of the program. Um, but uh, I think you are constrained by the technology available, especially if you're a designer in a technology company, because ultimately you're delivering the technology. These are tools at, their, at, at the very base of the products that Apple produce. They are tools to perform functions. Mm. And I think also that that constraint in itself it becomes evident when Apple developed their retail stores, which again we'll talk about a little bit later on. But sticking with the design DNA, as it's become known, good design, I think, is identified as the primary motivation for the production of products within Apple. Minimalism, for sure, when we look at other products from competing companies, they tend to be gaudy in comparison and vulgar in their inclusion of seemingly superfluous or unnecessary cruft in software and hardware. And well, I'm thinking of Samsung here. I'm thinking of all of the Windows computer experiences that are full of programs that you didn't want and don't want and are usually forced to remove. Um, hardware products that have just meaningless names and sentences and and serial numbers scrolled across the face of the device that you have to look at every time you use them. There are a million examples of other companies that I think add unnecessary cruft and and noise to the external designs of products, well, whether they're software or hardware. I think we're we're in the world of branding here. I think Apple just has a very strong brand and they're very consistent. Um they have brand guardians that make sure uh, that their guidelines are strictly adhered to, nothing ever extraneous, um, and all that kind of thing. And I think also you pay a premium for Apple products. And so I think Apple seriously burn a lot of energy in um, their design, their manufacturing, all those sorts of things to give us a nicer product to fondle. Whereas the other companies sell their products cheap and they see less value. In, in the... Yeah, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it is a premium brand. Yes. And definitely uh, like Michelin every, tires. Every, every product that they produce is at a considerably higher cost uh, than other products in the market made by other companies who are competing in the same space and who are producing products that effectively deliver the same utility. Right. That is to say you can write a document on any computer. Uh, with the same level of productivity, I would argue. Well, you'd be wrong. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. So, good design, especially in terms of Apple and their execution of design, simplicity, and KISS. Keep it simple, uh -huh. stupid. Right. Always keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate things. And never add something that does, simply doesn't need to be added, or you add something on a whim. You could be, you're probably wrong. Is it necessary for the function? Is it muddying the form? Don't add it. I don't and like that I think, term. Well, it, it sounds like keep it simple, stupid. It yeah, is. Yeah, let's keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> keep it simply stupid. Yeah. No, keep it simple, stupid. I think that's important because Steve Jobs famously said he's as proud of what he has left out of his products than what the innovation has brought into the products. So when he held up the original iPhone, he was happy that he left out all the functionality that he did, which was a considerable amount of functionality. I remember at the time, people thought, no copy and paste? How can, you, how can a, a smartphone be smart if you cannot copy and sure? paste? I'm 100% positive. It was, a, it was brought in at a later date. Um, but the idea was is that it's such a radically new platform and it's such a new paradigm in portable computing, we simply don't want to overwhelm your senses by adding all of the features that we technologically could add, of course. They chose not to. They deliberately try, and try to keep 
their design as simple as possible and as accessible as possible, which goes hand in hand, of course. So I think we should move on to um, the personalities that have been primarily driving design in Apple. And of course, we must mention Steve Jobs, who is the co-founder of Apple and also the chief design influence. Well, he's the e eternal leader. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, it is a cult of personality, really. Well, it is, of course. Uh, and, and it's worked very well. And his acolyte, of course, is the British industrial designer. And again, we must spend some time defining that term. Johnny Ive. Um, he is responsible for much of the new wave of Apple products from their resurrection. And I think the original iMac uh, yeah. represents, and the, and the original iPod represents their, their phoenix-like rise from the near ashes and uh, it, a complete trajectory into the stratosphere uh, since yes. then, I think. Well, I think we should preface this by also acknowledging that Apple, we're all about, um, well, maybe not we're all about, but Apple uh, weren't, it wasn't just since Johnny Ive joined the ship that they um, started to make such beautiful products. Um, no, and absolutely. Yeah, and they've always had an eye for these things. That for sure, but he's had massive, massive influences. Steve Jobs, his salient attributes in terms of the design in Apple, I think, were that he was a micromanager. I mean, I read uh, Walter Isaacson's book, and it really paints uh, an interesting picture of Steve Jobs, the man and the manager. He was a micromanager. He was a perfectionist. Uh, he was a consistentist. So he was very much thinking about a solid line moving steadily into the future and not being massively disruptive uh, in terms of design. So mm. his approach to design was very consistent, even though designs wax and wane throughout the history of the products of Apple. I should also add um, that he was also um, almost certainly a, a narcissist and a control freak and in many ways a terrorist. Um, but I think those... Um, are part of uh, his character that set him apart, perhaps. He just went that extra mile that other people wouldn't. And even though it must have been hell to be around him, us, at the end of the chain, we got these amazing products. And no, we're he... happy to spend all this money uh, on buying them. Absolutely. By, by whatever means, he mean, motivated yeah, them. Yeah, I don't mean to, like an ad hominem, but I think that was important to add. No, absolutely. I mean, that seems to be the general consensus. Um, and, of course, there's Johnny Ive, a younger designer acolyte of Steve Jobs. They were very close, and Johnny Ive is very much a minimalist. He seems to be massively influenced by Dieter Rams. And, and massive Brown. as well. I don't know about that so much. <laughs> and he's a purist uh, in that he, he, unlike Steve Jobs, I think he really has a strong mind for environmental um, Consciousness. You think? I think so. I think the way in which he approaches the manufacturing of products, he's very concerned with recycling and making parts from parts mm. and trying to reduce the part count yeah. of products. Being resourceful. Yeah, if he could make an iPod, for instance, out of a single piece of metal, he would do it. He's after the grand unifying theory of environmentally friendly industrial product design. Yeah, but you see, I mean, he makes those noises, but I've got a feeling that all companies are like that. I mean, they wouldn't, you know, cut a hole out of a bit of metal and then throw the metal away, throw the rest, throw all the bits they don't use away. No, absolutely. But I think what most companies actually do is that they would cut a hole out of metal and then all of the offcuts, they would melt down and make more of the same product. Whereas Johnny Ive seems to invest an enormous amount of time in working out how he can cut that bit of metal and just keep cutting that bit of metal to the point where there's literally no offcut mm. and nothing to recycle. Just aluminum dust. Yeah, so I, you know, when I watch, for instance, uh, a video on how one of the so-called unibody aluminium laptops are produced, I and I can imagine anybody would immediately put in, be put in mind of how cloth is cut to make clothing. Mm. You know, every possible square is... Um, utilized and uh, to have the, the smallest possible waste. 
mean, it's difficult to melt down cloth, of course. You really, it's, it's woven. You really do need to use every, every square centimeter. Uh, metal can be melted down, but of course, that's a cost. It costs in time. It costs in energy. And uh, I think Apple really do think about the manufacturing process. They, they build the manufacturing process, and then they hand it off to a country where labor is cheaper, they can get all of the benefits of the that the economic process zones in China, for instance, have to offer. But, but uh, you know, they take that's for another podcast. They, they take design down to the. They are consistent in that they shoot through their design obsession from the visual appeal of a product right down to how it's manufactured. And of course, Steve Jobs was famous for making his breadboards and the the actual processor arrangement inside the computers to be as attractive as possible because he thought you know it must look good from the inside to the outside and that's you know the consistent passion that he had for design i mm. think they both had a, a huge amount to contribute and i think maybe they are too responsible for the design direction in apple making them a little bit less yeah, flexible. i don't know i just think they are the faces we see but i don't really know how much um uh, what's the word? Um, well, we can't possibly know exactly how design is laid out inside the company or what goes on inside the company. And again, they are the celebrities of the company, and we're used to seeing them in their funny black T-shirts and talking slowly on uh, videos. Johnny Ive does that. He uh, speaks very slowly and quietly. He and, does. Uh, he's, he's like a gentle giant kind of man. Just another word on Steve Jobs' sense, which I think is uh, an interesting point. Um... He spoke really interestingly on a talk a few years ago. Um, he he was talking about type and typography. So I think uh, Apple had a, um, a lot to do with Adobe, or Adobe had a lot to do with Apple. I think Apple had shares in Adobe, I don't quite remember. But obviously it was thanks to that um, which sort of started Apple being um, the primary tool for graphic designers. And uh, Steve Jobs would speak about his obsession and attention to detail with type and kerning and tracking and all these other things that uh, computers up till that point, you know, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't associate computers with uh, that level of um, intricate control of type, um, or at least not the home computer. Uh, and I think that's important to raise because uh, Steve Jobs was a visionary right from the tiniest, tiniest little details. No, no, certainly. The, the I mean, pixel width of a serif. In, in Isaacson's book, he uh, he talks about how Steve Jobs literally agonized over typography and exactly the placement of words, letters, stanzas, you name it, anything to do with type. He would spend an enormous amount of time redesigning, perfecting, and uh, ultimately annoying a lot of his. Uh, colleagues and employees yeah to hell with them they're nobodies no but, um, you know uh, but that's a core ethos you know his uh, obsession with such detail which uh, you know puts out yeah, where they, it is well they agonize over design and uh, Dieter Rams himself uh, said that uh, Apple take design seriously it's one of the very few companies that really genuinely do take design seriously and uh, of course some of the products that Dieter Rams designed for Braun do have quite a, a significant familiar feel to them when we uh, consider Apple's products. Um, yeah, it was interesting to see Dieter Rams being on board with Apple. Um, I wondered whether or not there might have been some kind of, I don't know, some kind of uh, litigation or something. Um, but, yeah, exactly that. Um, but maybe Dieter Rams You think being, he's getting some uh, royalties? Absolutely. But I think you know Dieter Rams being design visionary that he uh, was and is, um, recognized Apple as being this amazing company uh, and uh, softened. I don't, I don't know. But well, I can imagine he saw Apple as... I'm sure a bit of Googling will bring up yeah, a load of stuff. No doubt. But uh, he was a member of the Functionalist School of Industrial Design and uh, he saw in Apple the seeds of his own design ethos to be generous. Didn't he design the Apple, the SE Mac, the one that you've got? Mm, I'm not sure. It is that. a German design company. I th really? I, think mm, I don't know if it is. Probably sure. wasn't. Um, and it, it looks like one of his products. And indeed. And uh, minimalism uh, was definitely the clarion call of his general movement. And Steve Jobs, of course, did say that he was as proud for what he didn't include as what he, uh, he did include. 
Sounded like a sermon, the way you just said that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Steve Jobs, of course, also was uh, telling customers what they want. And he said this many times. He said uh, the consumer doesn't know what he wants, especially when it comes to innovative, cutting-edge technology, new technology, game-shifting technology, where the consumer may even struggle to see the utility of such new products. Mm. And this gives Steve Jobs the, uh, the latitude mm. to really be quite prescriptive in precisely what it is you want. And I think he used this. You know, he really was, and again, through the power of his and the persuasion of his personality, he was able to convince people, some say through his hucksterism, that they really need the product that he was trying to sell to them. Yeah, again, I don't think we should attribute all of that to Steve Jobs. I, mean, I think, you know, Apple's big company with well, he was the front, a lot of people he driving. Was the front, yeah, no, indeed. He, he was the face of a, a large company yes. with a, a, a generally consistent direction. Fair enough. Um, but it, it is the c human computer interaction um, that Apple was uh, very much involved with. And this is how people interact and use computer technology. How do we actually use the products? in order to achieve the goals that we wish to achieve. So an example would be a computer. How do we interface with a computer in order to create a document? How do we use a portable telephone in order to make a call? There is a certain efficiency of motion required to have a comfortable engagement with a bit of technology in order to achieve a goal. And I think Apple certainly think about this. They think, okay, we, we have these technologies. Humans are shaped the way they are shaped. They move in the way that they move. We have focus groups. Uh, how do we actually make this a pleasant and enjoyable experience? I'm thinking of, I don't know why, but I immediately think about commuting. I had a nightmare commuting on a train to get to the office. And I thought, how can I change the awful experience of this commute into an experience that I actually enjoy, not just tolerate. How do I turn it around? How do I make this into something I enjoy? And uh, my solution was to cycle. By cycling, I'm doing the same effective job. I'm moving my body from one location to the other, but I'm doing it in a way that I actually enjoy. And I think Apple think about their products and they think, okay, well, this potentially could be quite a laborious and tedious process doing whatever it is you need to do. Is it even possible? Can we even comprehend turning it around and making it enjoyable? And I think they have achieved that. I mean, what I like? think, well, well, the graphic user interface on the computer desktops, for instance. I mean, it, it was enjoyable in that you felt like you were more involved in the computer, even though you were more abstracted away from... I'm thinking early Apple operating systems versus the alternative. So you had the Unixy systems, you had the um, DEC systems, and Windows, early Windows systems, which were just, there were no graphic user interfaces. They were all text, um, and they worked very well, very quickly. You could type a, a letter on a screen, and it, it immediately appears. And you press Enter on the keyboard, Ooh, and it immediately executes. Early operating systems. Oh, in, in general. In, okay. in, in general. Yeah. Whereas Apple, very early on, saw the benefit of a graphic user interface where you would have a mouse uh, as well as a keyboard, mm. and you're able to almost have a 10,000 foot view of what it is you're doing. Yes. Whereas with the text-based operating systems, you would be in it. You would be there. You'd be closer and it would be quicker. But you wouldn't have that sort of standaway view of your computing landscape. You would have to make that up. Like reading a book versus watching a movie. Reading a book, you would need to use up a lot of your processing cycles in your brain to visualize the landscape of whatever it is you're reading, the imaginary world that's trying to be uh, defined in the text. Whereas a movie, a lot more is given to you. You're, given, you're able to stand back more, and arguably you're able to think more And arguably it. you don't need to know how to read. No, indeed. Well, that's the thing. Well, but not everybody is... Yeah, know, I mean, just... Ultimately, we want to do a job and get the job done. 
and there's arguments for either direction. Right. Some people are able to get things done. I mean, I'm in computing. I'm a lot of the time I'm able to complete things a lot quicker on the command line. Whereas the graphic user interface gives you a greater ability to do things almost in parallel or, or simultaneously, two different tasks, I find personally, that's my personal viewpoint. And I think the guiding principle of making human-computer interaction easier and pleasurable perhaps compromises a little bit of the straight-off functionality that you might get in doing things in a little bit different way. Well, uh, what to say about that is, with Apple, it was always about not being um, a, a real techie, geeky sort, um, and being able to use computer to do what you want it to do. Whereas you got to remember, you know, where it all came from was, you know, computers were used by a certain type of person. Um, and Apple came along with their Mac and uh, made, um, made it easy for everyone to get involved. Yeah, there's greater accessibility. There. But again, I mean, they popularized that. I mean, we shouldn't talk about that too much because we know, you know, the graphic user interface and mouse and all that stuff was obviously there before yeah. Mac came along. Indeed. And Elisa. We should probably talk about um, uh, what doesn't work, where Apple have missed the mark. Well, absolutely. We'll get to that. But suddenly I'm struck by a memory of a... I don't know what relevance this has. I think it is relevant. I think it's a changing paradigms and different approaches. I was watching a interview between Don Bluth, who worked for Disney. He was the head of animation at Disney. A very long time ago indeed and then he became disillusioned and set up his own company and left left disney don bluth and larry elin i believe his name is i'll correct this in the notes if i'm wrong larry elin was one of the chief animators on tron the original tron movie which was a disney movie but incorporated a lot of computer graphics mm. and uh in the interview larry elin was quite a lot younger than don bluth i think it was in the 80s uh, Don Bluth is still alive. I think he's hmm, pushing 80, I believe. But again, facts that we can... Uh, well, maybe we can ask him. We'll, we'll pop this uh, uh, in the show notes. But Don Bluth, he was a traditional animator. He, didn't le he left a Disney because he thought Disney was getting too involved in newer technologies and that they were losing the soul of animation. And by traditional animation, I mean cell by cell, an arm moves up, the next cell, it moves laborious, up a little bit more. Super pain, laborious. But the, his, what he wanted to do was get out of the way. The whole point of his style of animation was to make a story, an animated story, engage you in the story, and you're completely unaware of the animation. He completely stands back. And he's able, his argument is, that he is able to make non-existent personalities and living things they are alive he brings them to life through his traditional animation cell by cell animation and he steps back and you're unaware of it whereas larry elin who was absolutely at the vanguard of um, computer animation at the time could make things move he said i make things move this technology makes things move it does not bring things to life and that was the different the difference Don Bluth was unable to make that leap or to develop in that way. He was stuck in traditional animation, always, even when he made computer games. He made the Dragon's Lair arcade game that was based on a laser disc, but it was all traditional animation. Whereas Larry Elin, can, he could see the future. Mm. The future is making things move, but a, you know, and will continue making things move until we traverse the uncanny valley where you have you can always tell that something's synthetic mm. and he thinks he could see the future and the future is there will become a point where you cannot tell things are synthetic and yet they're not alive whereas traditional animation could make it alive and the tenuous link mm, of this yes. little <laughs> anecdote is the difference between the direction that the style and design of the graphic user interface and apple's direction and heavy emphasis on aesthetics moves into the future and purely utilitarian we're completely focused on the goal and the job 
and sacrifice everything to get there approach of some other company. That was my tenuous link. But moving on. Moving on. Yeah, I might need to listen to that again. No. Just to, uh... Perhaps, but it's certainly uh, a little interview that's worth Googling and watching. It's right. really very interesting indeed because okay. it, it just seems like a, class of, a clash of civilizations. And that feeling I, I get from Apple in that they're sufficiently different and they have a yeah. sufficiently I different ideas to other companies where they're, they stand out mm. as radically different. But let's lighten the mood by talking about a particular design element that I think is key in Apple, and that's the logo. Right. The logo itself. I mean, we're all very familiar with logos and company logos. Every, every company has a logo. There are billions. You, have, you range from companies like IBM, who have a logo that is utterly sacrosanct. They'll never, ever, ever change it. Yeah, ever. Say that. It's always been the same. It could change tomorrow. But it never has changed. And it is very much a part of who they are, and they're big on their logo. And uh, you get other companies who have horrible logos, like... Some of the Korean manufacturers. Again, what makes like them Samsung. horrible? This is, we're it's, we're it's getting back into that vague subjective. It is. What makes a horrible it logo? It is. It absolutely is subjective. But Apple's logo clearly um, has stood the test of time. Uh, it's timeless in many ways. I mean, just, just from, a, you know, from a branding point of view, in terms of an identity, um, it's very recognizable uh, as a mark. You can just see it. You know, you know um, exactly what it is. Um, you know it's quality. Well, it is what it is. It, it is, is an apple. It is what it is. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I mean, I I liked the old uh, the old rainbow apple logo, and I thought it was a sad day when they got rid of that because at the time it was very popular to have gradients and uh, drop shadows and stuff. And when they got rid of the uh, the stripy apple logo, it was kind of apples the apple logo shape but with a kind of radial blend inside of it on with a kind of white key line, I think, on top of another grey background and, or something like that. Hmm. And um, <laughs> Well, I remember when it happened. It was very much a product of the time, but then again, that's Apple. Yeah, they, they greatly inflated the size of the logo on most of their products and, and lost the colour. And I just thought, you're losing the colour. And I thought... And indeed, I, I think Apple have always had a weird relationship with colour. Hey... What I should say, though, is um, by keeping things clean and simple, you make them timeless. See, I think that uh, in a hundred years, when we, yes us, look back um, at Apple through the ages, we'll look at Apple of now, of, of contemporary time, 2013, um, as being completely timeless and wonderful. Whereas we look back at Apple of the 90s, as the one I was just talking about, when they lost the uh, stripy logo, and think, God, isn't that a horrible product of its time? It's so... Yeah, but is it, is it only because it's not contemporary? And when I mean, when I say contemporary, what I mean by that is it's not happening now. It's already over. What is? It's an old logo, the stripy logo. So when you say you look back at it and you think, ugh, that's only because it hasn't persisted. Had it persisted, we would think about it differently, I would have thought. Uh, Perhaps. Oh, the, well, maybe. Or do you think maybe the stripy logo? No, I, I wasn't particularly talking about the stripy logo. I was talking about when we lost the stripy logo. I just think like, it, it's like a golden rule. You keep things clean and simple. Um, and it's timeless. Yeah, but clean and simple and dull? Dull, but, well, that's your opinion. It is an opinion, but the lack of dull color... Dull is a pejorative. Whereas it I is, think it is stylish and sophisticated. Well, no, you could look at it that way. But also you could think, well, all of their products are grey. <laughs> no, they're great. Well, yes. <laughs> but I think, you know, I remember the days when we had the, the upside-down logo... <laughs> issue was it upside down or was it not and i think <laughs> interesting it sounds you should explain so, what it, you mean by it that it sounds so trivial and yet i think it, it really is quite interesting well here oh, no this is a good way to segue into talking about where i think apple have got it wrong so a way into that might be talking about the upside down logo yeah so the upside down logo was the lid of the laptops so the laptops went through a period well, where... The, G, the G3. Yeah, they G3. sort of had both logos. They had the color logo and... Oh, the, yeah, they it, had, was, it was very transitory And stage. they had the new logo. So they had the colored logo on the inside of the screen that faced the user when using the laptop. And the lit, the logo taking advantage of the backlit liquid crystal screen on the outside, on the lid of the laptop. And that would be 
upside down as perceived by somebody standing watching the person using a laptop. So the idea behind this logo was when you, and which is part of the aesthetic, when you have your laptop in front of you and the lid is closed and you're, you're sliding it across the table towards yourself to open the lid, it presents to you the Apple logo. And you're looking at the Apple logo and you're thinking, aha, this is my Apple laptop and the, the Apple is sitting at the right angle to you. And you open the lid and you're presented with another Apple logo at the bottom of the screen. But of course, everybody else who is looking at you see the logo is upside down, but you're not seeing it as upside down. It's all about you. You're using the laptop. Mm. So I think this was quite an argument. I can imagine a heated argument in an internal cafe at you know, Apple saying, it's look. It's bizarre. I think there's a right are way we of doing are it. We, are we and they, they did it the wrong way. Are we advertising the logo to others or are we not? But once, of course, it's lit, then it becomes obvious that, hey, there's an apple over there and it's upside down and I can see it because there's backlighting. Do you know what I think? It, I mean, again, I've not Googled this or anything like that, but I think it must have been f for when... Um, DJs, you know, DJs, they used to play records, remember records? And now they pretty much just plug in their portable music player or their laptops into their decks, or whatever the correct term is. And I think it was in a nightclub or some venue where you'd just seen illuminated upside down Apple logo. And I thought everyone at Apple must have smacked their foreheads. Absolutely. It is one of those moments. But again, you can see the justification on both sides. And here's a photograph of a typical lecture hall at a typical American university. And everybody has a laptop. I thought that was an Apple thing. I mean, I thought that was it, at Apple or something. No, this is just a university lecture hall. And uh, everybody has an Apple. There's not and a course, single non-MacBook. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure there are. No, no, I, look, I looked at this. And that's why I assumed it was a... Um... But uh, you can see that little logo. And it seems, in, in terms of brand recognition and advertising... Are, are listeners like going to be able to see these? A real or are they coup. just going to close their eyes and imagine what we're looking at? Well, I think you can close your eyes and imagine. Because we're describing it so well. But of course, as I said at the very beginning... We're publishing our working notes. So, of course, yes. uh, please refer to the notes, uh, which will be on the website, eclecticist.co.uk. The link to the podcast, the MP3 file, will be on the uh, front page of the website. And also there will be a link to the published notes. And uh, in the interests of transparency, uh, the way in which we produce our notes, we create a document on Google Docs, uh, for free, which is very nice of them, and it very conveniently exports to HTML. Free with a little asterisk. Very nicely indeed, and uh, you can read them, and of course Google can read them, and the NSA can read them if they And all so our wish. personal details as well. Of which... course, and all of your personal details as well when you have a long to read it. Yeah, um, we should, um, yeah, we should probably do more of those little stings and jingles and things like that. Um, talking about where Apple have got it wrong. This is a little personal... Um... But before you do, can I just read to you what Apple say in terms of their design and their human interface guidelines, which is part of their current human interface guidelines, which incorporate the new IL-7, which we'll talk about a little bit later, which is evidently, according to many in the press, uh, a, a bit of a change, a bit of a, a disruptor. Well, knives are out. We should talk about that. We will indeed. But in Apple's own words... The display of an iOS device is at the heart of the user's experience. Not only do people view beautiful text, graphics, and media on the display, they also physically interact with the multi-touch screen to drive their experience, even when they can't see the screen. Hmm. Now that's specific to the iOS, the operating system that runs on their portable devices, uh, but also it's generally um, how they view the, the general user experience in terms of their design. I just thought it was important to read that because that's that's how they see it. And they are quite prescriptive on the design, especially to third-party developers and mm. their own internal developers. Everything Absolutely. should really integrate Absolutely. with their I mean, general outlook. We, we should, again, we should, you know, paint that picture or make that clear. The fact that I think that's a big part of what makes Apple Apple is their consistency. Um Keeping everything in line, you know, having strict guidelines that you absolutely must adhere to. And I'm all for um, them rejecting uh, or being very strict um, with their apps. Uh, and oh, and they are. I yeah, mean, absolutely. you can only you can only obtain apps for certainly the portable 
devices from the Apple App Store. It's the only way you can get them onto your device. Actually, yeah, while I remember, I mean, this might be a little bit of a tangent. We can probably cut this out. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that how in the dark days of Apple, and this is when I was um, just starting out as a designer using a beige Mac at the end of the 90s, um, you could generally, the, the, the attitude was, or the public perception was, you could buy product, you, you could buy everything for Windows, um, and Mac had very little software available for it. But you see, but that, worked in the end because it's all about quality. Apple didn't have everyone making all these products, you know, under the Apple name. So they could keep everything, you know, under their control and ultimately under their quality control. Whereas you had 50 million crappy things for Windows machines um, that were ghastly. Well, this goes back to the prescriptive nature of Apple's general outlook, which is we know what's best and we're going to control what you consume on our devices, which, of course, they are a hardware manufacturer. Ah. They're, 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 unlike, let's say, another company like, uh, well, Google, for instance, Google, their revenue doesn't come from hardware sales, whereas, arguably, the biggest portion of Apple's revenue is from hardware sales. Yes, they produce a lot of software, and they provide a lot of services, and uh, sales from iTunes and, you know, a little bit of royalty from selling other people's content. But mostly, they are still a hardware company. Mm. Whereas Google, they can produce products, and their money comes from, you know, farther down the line. Amazon, another company, their revenue comes from down the line. They can sell their hardware for no profit. There's no, no but, margin again, on Kindles. I, they make their money yes. from selling the content. Where I thought you were going to go with that was about sort of Apple's Trump card. Uh, probably not the right expression, um, or Apple's, uh, what do they call unfair advantage, or advantage, is the fact that they are a hardware and a software manufacturer. And so um, they make their software, you can, you can help me out here, they make the software, uh, and they know exactly where that software is going to be. Better integration. Yeah. They, they, they have a fewer number of hardware platforms to satisfy with their software, whereas the developer of a an application developer, a programmer for the Windows platform, ultimately will have to satisfy many more platforms because of the Microsoft licensing framework. I mean, their business model is to license their software to hardware. Mm. Therefore, there's a much greater variety of hardware making the life of a designer that much harder. Mm. It's more difficult to optimize their software for hardware when there's so much more hardware. Mm. Anyway, we're getting off the track here because I, I really wanted to talk about um, where... No. Well, getting back, onto the, <laughs> getting back onto the rails, I think we should go along and start talking about uh, the software. No, because we haven't talked about where Apple have got it wrong. Because I, I think what would probably be... Your average listener will probably be able to um, relate and empathize to all the things that frustrate us with Apple, uh, particularly me. In terms of design, you mean? Yeah, They're design faux pas. Yeah, big time. So in hardware or software or just generally? Well, hardware. Um, and I think that comes with the territory because I think because Apple uh, prides themselves as being such innovators, you know, they're not going to get it right all the time. Um, or they're going to they're going to do things. Yeah, they're, they're going to do things where um, the pundits are making a lot of noise about how Apple have dropped the ball. Like for example, I remember the hoo ha when the iMac came out and Apple completely ditched removable media, floppy disks. And now we look back and I think, yeah, well done, Apple. Well done for getting rid of floppy disks. They were crap. And the same with CDs and super drives and all the rest of it. But where they've gotten it wrong, in my view, um, or where they tripped up or where they fumbled, you know, those sorts of expressions. Puck mouse, everyone uh, agrees that that was crap. You never knew which way it was pointing. Um, it was uncomfortable. It was inaccurate. Um, it, was it looked the, awful. It looked cheap. Uh, well, I, I think, again, it's a product of its time, I think. I think that whole translucent thing. I think Apple, I mean, I, I don't really know, but I've got a feeling Apple really popularized the whole, um, like, ice um, misted Well, no, not so much transparency. Look, not so much that. I mean, the actual build quality seemed pretty awful. I mean, the button seemed to hinge just on, on the thermo thermoplastic plastics that they used. The actual hinges were just crimped plastic. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> it seemed like the I, button I, would just break. You know, I, I never use one often enough, but also it's worth mentioning that 
despite the... I don't think anybody used them often enough. Wow, wow. Well, they put I, them in their little yeah. junk drawers pretty um, quickly. No, it, it came attached to uh, the first G3. Uh, not the first G3, but the first G3 in the Bondi blue case. Now, I, I saw one of these recently, because it's definitely in the world of retro computing now, but it was this um, completely new way to have your computer uh, in, a de in a tower. And it has, you, you know what I'm talking about, the people at home. It uh, is the thing with, looks like it has four handles on each corner. And it's very easy to pick up, it's very easy to open. Um, has a latch that you just can open. You can even open it while it's running, um, although I don't think you're supposed to. Um, and it's easy to add RAM or add another hard drive or do whatever with it. And it was so easy. Um, and all previous towers at that point, you'd have razor sharp edges, they were beige, they were just completely anonymous looking boxes. No, indeed. So, an Apple. Well, they were the first to no, do but they've beige. totally changed the game. And now, I think every computer manufacturer tries to make their boxes a little bit more interesting. Um, well, I mean, there are niche markets, for sure. I mean, I've been very surprised in the way in which I consider desktop hardware, uh, because it, it is very interesting. I think, um, and it's worth talking about, I think Apple, the mistakes, not so much the mistakes, but the frustrations that I have had with Apple desktop hardware range from the iMac the new iMac, well, even the old iMac, the old, the earliest flat screen iMac took up a lot of space, a lot of space. These were small computers, but still managed to take up an awful lot of desktop space. For instance, you, you couldn't, with traditional desktop computers, you could hide the actual computer and you cable up a monitor, which could be very slimline. I mean, very early on, you had Sony flat screen monitors, which were incredibly thin TFT panels mm. on a very nicely um, adjustable stock, which would take up very little of your desk space. Mm -hmm. And the computer itself, you didn't care because you put another yeah, okay, desk you, oh, and it's uh, far away. Now, hang on. The, the IMAX, no, you, no. they didn't have visa, visa mounts. You couldn't take the base I'm, off. No, I'm going to have to just simply stop you there. I think you didn't care about the Mac. Uh, the computer, rather. And I just think you're not taking into consideration this whole new generation of computer users that did care about the computer. Apple made you care about the computer. They made the computer interesting. They made the computer an object of desire, something you have in your home. A, um, what would you call it? Something like your TV. Mm. Your, the Apple became a consumer... Well, it's a sculpture. Yeah, or something like that. And actually, in what you didn't say about the first flat-screen iMac was uh, how much of a joy it was to use, because you could just grab its monitor... And twisted around and uh, and height adjustable and height and they had stand was it? yeah was they, well, of course it was I don't remember that anyway look I'm just going to of course it was I'm I'm just going to rattle off uh, the design um, uh, yeah nice. it looked like a sunflower it was inspired by a sunflower. <laughs> it looked like a yeah a desk lamp this is the the white plastic flat paneled iMac an that had the famous chrome neck the highly adjustable chrome neck which you could actually grab and and lift up the entire Mm. computer with quite comfortably yes and uh and a round um hemispherical computer base so the gubbins of the computer wasn't behind the monitor which i think steve jobs definitely he definitely uh firmly was against and uh mm. and the whole thing was a very pleasing device but i speak in terms of getting things done and using a computer as a tool to do your job so if you're in an office and you're doing a job looking at the actual beauty of the computer doesn't necessarily help you get your yeah, deadlines. But, uh, again, having uh, it under the desk and having it very powerful and having your human computer interface components, the, the keyboard, the video screen, and the mouse, the KVM, having those right in front of you, the best possible screen and the largest possible screen, the keyboard, which is easy to push away so you can eat your lunch, and the mouse. That's what you care about, and that's what I care about now. No, okay, but that's what you care about, and I think it's important to get this on the table, which is there's two sort of mindsets here. Um, there is the computer user who it really is all about what you're using the computer for, and I think there's the Mac user where, um, as I already said, <laughs> it's just two it's just two different worlds, I think, which well, is probably I, a discussion I, 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 for a, a different think, a different think, podcast, I think, but. 
to me, it's a beautiful thing, and I get a real joy from using it. it you know, it, it gives me a, a thrill. The actual to, hardware. The actual just, just generally, desktop you know, box. and I think that's why. No, we're specifically talking about the desktop hardware. Yeah, no, all Apple products, and I think that's why we're happy to pay such exorbitant um, prices for their products. But of course, because so many of us see them as something aesthetic, not just something to do our work with. I think we equate Windows. I mean, I know we we're going to talk about this, but this is just just as a, to explain what I'm try, try to explain what I'm getting at. Windows, we equate that with work and boredom and cubicles. Macs, we equate with being at home and enjoying uh, doing cool stuff like uh, editing a, a video or uh, you know using GarageBand or something. But in terms of the hardware, we're talking about the hardware here, and and I'm looking at a photograph now of the latest, latest, latest iMac yeah, desktop gorgeous. computer. Now, to me, we're, we're moving the direction, the clear, obvious direction we're moving here is to the display. Mm. As the little blurb I read from the human computer interface design guidelines for mm. iOS, it's all about the screen. And Apple have always been about the screen. And now the technology is coming along to the point where it really is only the screen. Mm. I mean, the new iMac is effectively a screen. Yeah. There are no longer, as you say, the removable media is, is going and very much, Apple have been designing all of their technology and, and, and helping other companies design technology to increase the bandwidth of cables. They're all about cables. You've got Thunderbolt 2 now. You know, we've got 10 gigabit interfaces. And for instance, the new, the new Power desktop, the designer's desktop, the new Mac Pro, which is a long time coming, the Mac Pro, the very, very large cased Mac, um, has been getting older and older and older mm, for a very mm. long period of time. And it's, it's significantly underpowered compared to other desktop workstations, as they're called. The new Mac Pro, which is coming later this year, so mm. we're told, is again getting back onto the desk. It wants, it wants to be on your desk. Mm. It wants to be, sit there, and it wants you to plug in all of your peripherals, your super drives and your RAID arrays and all the rest. You don't put disk drives in the box. It's no longer a container mm. It is the brain, and you plug everything into it. So it's all about cables again. Mm. Even though the photography will tell you, will inform you from their website that there are no cables. You rarely see cables, but it's all about cables. Yes. Again, that is the new, whatever it's called, the Pro. What's it called? I think it's the Mac Pro. Yeah. It's it's such an incredible departure from what there is previous. You know, It, it might be another G4 Cube. It might be something... Um, that it's sort of that die, kind of dimension. Anyway. Now, I'm going to... you know get this out <laughs> even if it kills you and that's the thing about where apple has screwed up um i think we spoke about the mouse and i think the, the whole mouse argument they've still not gotten it right um there was the mouse that had the little ball in the top of it um what was that called the magic mouse i think and every single as a I'm mighty mouse yeah the, is it mighty mouse uh, yeah the mighty mouse uh, as a freelance designer i have to use ver various different macs and it's usually the you know, Mac that no one else uses. And it's all, that bowl is always clogged up with crap and finger scum, and it's frustrating to use. Uh, there are ways of cleaning it, I know, but... Well, I had to break into mine. Well, there you go. Um, great. Now, the Magic Mouse, which in many ways is, is, is a wonderful device, I really like that you can tickle its back to... Um, move around a document. So this is a this is a, a traditional mouse, but it's wireless. You move it around. Yes. But you can also tickle its back like a touchpad. So it's not stationary. You do move it around. No, it you, slides. No, but you feet. don't tickling its back isn't scrolling. Yeah, it's scrolling. It's not moving the cursor around. Well, gestures, gestures, yeah, yeah, yeah. and scroll. Gestures, gestures. Yeah. Um, but even then, it still can be extremely irritating to use because you just you know you, you pick it up. You put it down, you pick it up, and occasionally you'll brush across it, and you'll be looking at a web page, and that web page will fly out of the way, and it's like, oh, I've got to get that back. Um, and there's just loads of little problems like that. Plus, also, it uses batteries, uh, and there's no wired alternative to that. So it's not rechargeable. No. You have to use rechargeable yeah. double A's now, or triple A's. Now, about that, so Apple have this thing where they don't have that amazing mouse that, um, where you can plug it in, because it doesn't bother me not having a wire. Uh, for my mouse or a keyboard. I mean, how often do you use your? Key how often do you move your keyboard? Does one move one's keyboard? I don't move it very often, so I really don't want to have to buy batteries. So it annoys me. And I think Apple could do something where they make ba like a battery inside of these devices, like a laptop battery that you recharge. You know, why not? Well, like an Xbox controller. 
I don't which know. has batteries in it, but you, you, you plug in a cable, a USB cable. Right. And you can play with the cable plugged oh, in. Oh, there you go. And it's so, charging, and, but when you want to move farther away, you just unplug well, it. Well, maybe Microsoft have a patent on that or something. Anyway, but I think... Um, and the same goes with Apple's... Well, that's true for Sony's controllers as well, I believe. But anyway. Right. Uh, Apple's crappy headphones. They're notoriously crap headphones that ship with um, iPods and I- iPhones. Sorry, we moved from mice to headphones. Uh, I'm just rattling them off. and then. Can I just say one thing on, on mice? I think it really is very subjective. Mice are super subjective. As you know, I use a trackball. So I'm... Do you? Yes. You still? Yes, absolutely. I right. professionally use a trackball, so the device itself does not move around. Right. It's always exactly where I expect it to be. I can I can be looking at the screen and I can move my hand to my mouse, and it I, I I'm perfectly targeted on it, the right orientation, mm. all the buttons because it doesn't move. It's mm. it's a stationary device, and because it's a ball, I can I have two very large full HD screens, so there's a lot of real estate to mouse over, mm. and with my mouse pointer acceleration settings i can spin that ball and glide all the way across the screens which i don't think you can do with a traditional mouse well apple clearly don't think it's a a good product otherwise they would make it um also you'd think apple well you wouldn't think they would but apple don't make a tablet like a wacom tablet because i've noticed um more and more designers tend to use these as i'm often alienated by the fact that there's a tablet in front of me um and uh, there was another thing that apple annoys me about in terms of their design. Did I not write them down? I guess that's probably it. But anyway, my strong conviction with some of these shortcomings that Apple use is they want to keep third-party companies in business who make products that don't have those failings. Um, For example, I mean, I saw quite a nice third-party mouse I think I like to buy. uh, Yeah, third parties are, are... They're the lifeblood of Apple, arguably. Yeah, and everyone throws away their iPod and iPhone headphones um, and buys proper headphones, buy headphones that actually work. Yeah, and Uh, I I think evidence to support that hypothesis, that they're really all about supporting their third-party producers. Well, they're not all about that. Not not all about that. They they obviously want to sell their products, but they are able to sell the amount of products that they are able to sell because there are a lot of manufacturers who support them with third-party development Mm. time they can spend more time developing their products because they can rely on third parties to develop supporting accessories Mm. and an example uh, a bit of evidence that i think would support that is the iphone case that they shipped a while one of their versions of their early iphone version they shipped with a case, and it was just extremely awful. It was the worst possible case. Which iPhone case. was that? Um, it, perhaps it was the 3GS. Right. I'm not sure. This is. A, we'll put this in the show notes. Uh, but it was awful, awful to the point where, wow, they're, they're oh, deliberately wanting okay. you. They, no, this is the other big problem with Apple, and this is probably the elephant in the room when it comes to their poor design. And it is poor design. This is dumb design. Apple, this is dumb design. And it is your iPhone. It's expensive, it's slippery and it's made of glass. And everyone has dropped their iPhone. And probably most people are on their second or on a replacement iPhone because they've dropped it and smashed it. Uh, that's a real um, pet hate of mine. And also, I would put that down to terrible design. Well, Apple. no. It's, no, it's, it's terrible design. I think it's, that... in your, it's handheld. Why don't they make it better to hold why don't they put a grip on it why don't they do something so you, you it doesn't slip out of your hand so much why do they make it out of glass that oh breaks? well well there you are i think this is the argument where i believe the design can get in the way it's form over function and i think that it's it's compromise they think okay well obviously we could make a phone that's made out of rubber and that has massive big rubber bumpers on the ends but we don't want that because it, it you know the fact the fact that you will drop your phone or that you can drop your phone disastrously. That fact of life is an unfortunate obstacle in, in the path of design beauty. You know, no, it's one of those things no. where good design no. should take that in, into consideration, but perhaps you just have to sacrifice Well, that. you said it, good design. It's not good design. The Apple iPhone, in my view, is not good design. It's not well designed. No, but... Yes, okay, both sides are glass. Well, one version of the iPhone, the iPhone 4 the family. The iPhone 4 and the 5. Were Isn't glass. The 5 glass? Now, the 5 is aluminium-backed. Right. And it has two glass panels 
on the back purely because they didn't want to block the radio like they did in the oh, titanium laptops. Oh, and this laptops. is the other thing. Well, this is not the other thing. I was going to mention about how um, uh, Apple... Uh, I mean, this is yeah, a bit all over the place, this link. But it was to do with Apple handheld products not having a radio on them. But I think this is what you said the other day about Sawtooth. The fact is we don't have a radio on the iPhone, and yet you know some crappy... Walkman that I used to have, you know, has a perfectly function. Yeah, thing. you advance, and, and some sometimes when you advance, it seems that you've taken a step backwards. Oh, but you've got but the BBC iPlayer. But generally, but yes, I can't listen to it because I've got no 3G. No, indeed, or it's patchy. And and with my phone, I was listening to. I, I I didn't have the time to download the podcast that I usually listen to on my commute. Uh, so I thought, what can I listen to? Well, I'll listen to the Today program on BBC Radio Four because I have a radio built into my phone. So definitely. It's handy. But then again, you have third-party applications and, and technologies that you can plug into your iPhone. Yeah. Well, there you go. Give you a radio. Again, so, that, that, that's back to my strong conviction yeah. that Apple want to support third parties. Yeah, they want to spend all of their development time on the core product, and they don't want to have to spend time on nice-to-haves that third parties can do. But what that gives you is that you have to plug in a lot more stuff into your Apple products. And again, the new Mac Pro desktop computer would seem to be all about connecting in your the things that you're absolutely going to need if you're going to be using that as a tool so you're going to want some kind of fiber channel or some sort of raid array to store all of your video that you're editing gigabytes terabytes of video that you're editing which you're absolutely are unable to store inside the mostly static flash i think it's pcie um, storage inside the mac pro uh, it's absolutely not expandable internally for storage. You have to plug it into a, an external storage array, which you will do, and you'll be happy to do it, given the incredible amount of bandwidth available in the uh, the, the expandable plug-in bandwidth, uh, Thunderbolt, and uh, uh, I think it's going to be Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 2, which is extremely high bandwidth. Should we do a time check? USB, I'm, I'm and, not sure and, how... And USB 3. So I think, in t looking at the clock... I think we need to, to speed along and talk about, um, I was going to, uh, I thought it would be good to talk about software design and evolution, but I, I really don't think we have the time for that, but maybe we'll leave that to the end. But if we, if we pop down to something I think which is a little bit more current uh, in terms of design, and that's the new design, the post-Steve Jobs design shift. Now, it's long been known, especially in the, the portable software platforms like iOS, that so-called skeuomorphism has been uh, quite popular in the application and operating system designs. So mm. By skeuomorphism, <laughs> what I mean, and this is a word that everybody learned uh, relatively recently, it is when but you have... it goes have, way back. When you, it does go way back. It's when you try to try to help people understand a new way of doing something by making it look or seem or act or behave like something previously that did a similar sort of something job. Something analog. Yeah, so an example in the uh, Apple world would be in the game center. You have an old gaming sort of desktop, a sort of a green base uh, for, for games that you used to play card games and a variety of games on many, many, many years ago, perhaps. Or perhaps you, you still play uh, casino games on green bays. Uh, but in, in terms of a computer, I mean, it's totally unnecessary, obviously, with computer games. Uh, but it gives it gives you a mental, a mental analog, a mental reference point for gaming. Perhaps that's the idea behind it. But throughout iOS in particular, there are lots of instances where there are very real, realistic looking textures like stitched leather and uh, paper, and, mm. uh, and there's a huge, always a, a massive uh, religious style debate over this in the design community where. There'll be people who suggest that it's it's a bad thing because it doesn't follow through. It's not consistent in iBooks. So you can continue turning pages forever in, in Ulysses or um, uh, you know a really really large book, War and Peace. You can continue turning the pages, but you don't get the sense that you're at a different position in the book because the leaves on either side of the open book are the same. Is that, really, is that really a problem? Has anyone actually said, I, this, oh my this God. This is a design issue. It's an issue of design. It's an issue, an issue of consistency. And it's well, where the consistency goes, breaks down. Oh my down. God, I can't believe this isn't a book. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, it says I'm at the end of the book, and yet I can see a thick bunch of pages And then you there. throw it on the ground. 
well, of course, that's not going to happen, but it's one of those little annoyances that I think the design purists in Apple, um, especially uh, Johnny Ive, take mm. issue with. And lots of designers take issue with that. They think it should be more pure. And it was always Steve Jobs and uh, the head of iOS. I forget his name. Larry Tesla. No. The head of iOS who was fired, actually fired. And he was a big uh, fan of skeuomorphism. And now that he and Steve Jobs have left oh, yeah. the building. That's right. Yeah. Now Johnny Ive is head of that. all software, I think. Okay, so well, we should start just talking about the, you know, the, 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 the technicals here. Well, I've actually had a play. Well, I think we've both had a play. You mean of iOS? This is iOS 7. I, iOS 7. Yeah. Okay, so iOS 7 is a departure in that they've, they've flattened it out. They simplified everything. They've... Take, seem to have taken a lot of design cues from a lot of other contemporary portable operating systems who have done the same, like uh, most famously uh, the Windows 8, the Windows 7.5, Windows 8 um, phone operating system, which is completely flat and very block colors, uh, no 3D um, icons or anything with shading or to give any impression of uh, three-dimensional um, objects. It's completely flat. And also the Google operating system, which the latest version is very simple, very flat, very neon, um, lots of block colors, lots of darkness. It's very dark. And Apple have come along and they've released uh, betas for their new iOS 7. And it's very light. It's very white. It's, it's like the, the inverse of uh, Google's mobile operating system. So there's lots of light, you know, lots of battery eating lights. They're very confident of their batteries and their, their new hardware. Uh, the iPhone, uh, but the colors, the use of color is quite contentious. I find it quite jarring uh, in comparison to the uh, iOS 6. I like it. It's, it's, it's happy. But definitely, it's, it's, it is lighter, it's brighter, it's more colorful. Um, You'd be wrong to say it's flat if you're going to go in but no, Well, no, it, it, it is flat, but it's a sort of it's flat looking, faux but it, but it's, flat. Well, it's not. It's not flat because they've actually used depth. In terms of you've well, got layers of things. Well, no, now. no, it, it, it's multiple flats. I suppose it's multiple planes layered on top of each other. So you have a sort of parallax motion between different uh, yeah, that's another, layers. That's another term that's been around forever, but we're only just learning about that. Well, no, no, yeah. So, parallax. What we mean by that is you can have a different angle on what would seemingly be a flat landscape. So it's, I guess, in in practice, it's layered glass so it's multiple panes of glass and each it's multiple mobile phones on top of each other the display so you can see through the layers and it can give you cues on the motion mm. and i think uh it's particularly nice when, you in, when you're multitasking you can only do it with the amazing display that the, the iphone has. yeah the iphone has an extremely high resolution display um, even though it's quite small relative to other contemporary mobile phones at the moment, uh, it's tall and it has an incredibly dense pixel um, display. Ah, oh, so something ridiculous. It is really very extremely high indeed. It's, it's higher than... It's actually not full HD, funnily enough. So it's actually as high definition as it is. It's, it's middle, mid-level now with all the other mobile phones that are on the market. There are, there are many full HD phones on the market now um which actually have a higher density of pixels mm. uh, but even so it's still incredibly high you, you cannot see individual pixels with the naked eye and uh, because of that beautiful gorgeous uh, high resolution screen and the very vibrant uh, screen technology that's used the overall effect is the sort of contrast level that you would get with ink on paper so it's lovely to use it's very consistent the motion the way in which you swipe and sweep things to and fro. It's a similar and consistent feel. And I believe uh, they consulted or employed or engaged or bought um, 3D physics engine type development company. So it's based on a physics engine that runs underneath. Uh, so you really do get a feel of real world, again, schemorphic movement and motion. You move things around and it's as if you really are pushing a page away. Uh, it's lovely. I think it's fantastic. And uh, the icons that have been designed, again, a little bit contentious. And I, I take issue with a little, a few of them. I think, you know, what the, f the, the icon for your gallery, for all of your photographs, where it could have been a photograph, uh, it isn't. It's uh, a symbol. Uh, it's an icon. It's uh, a set of colors. It's a color wheel. And uh, I think that's a bit of a departure. Um, you, you, they could have 
removed it entirely and just put the gallery inside the camera icon. Um, they could have done that. They didn't. They they've done what they've chose to have done. And uh, overall, I think it's it's clean. It's sleek. It is a departure in the flatness. I think the gradient, the color gradients, and the way they are sort of omnidirectional is a departure. The lighting isn't from one angle on all of them. The lighting sort of changes from icon to icon, um, which is interesting. But it's fresh. It's hip. It's snappy. They had to do something. I hip. feel. I yeah, feel they had to do something. You know, they are the. The I, leaders. I shouldn't say it like that because it's 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 suggesting that it was making changes for this for change's sake. Well, I, I, it must be. No, I, I, there are lots of um, little improvements that I've noticed when when using the beta version of this. But also, I think uh, what we should mention is just how well what I think is is the boring backlash to uh, this release that I've heard um, lots of chatter. About oh uh, Apple God, uh, and particularly leveled at this um this, the new Apple operating well, system. Well, people have a difficulty with change, any kind no, of change, and I mean, because of know, their high profile. I think it's nothing to do with it. I think it's the fact that Steve Jobs isn't here anymore, and Apple have been this successful company. It's just it's now time that Apple wasn't cool anymore. Yeah, well, you know, Apple, I am sure would say let's like let's let the numbers do the talking, and they're still selling. They're outselling like hot else. bananas, absolutely, because they build a better product because of for all of the reasons that we've we've provided, like uh, better integration because they produce the software and the hardware together. But in terms of design, I think uh, it's bold. The iOS seven look and the, the overall feel uh, with their hardware. So they're 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 they. An issue here is that they're they're delivering a new design feel, a new design paradigm but on the same hardware. So you'd think, perhaps, again, being puritanical here, they would want to release a new software experience with a new hardware experience. So they're almost contradicting themselves. You could say that they said the iOS 6 was designed specifically for this hardware, and it's our expression of hardware and software integrating and working together in tandem to give you the best possible experience. And yet they're sort of saying, well, no, actually, this is the best experience that you can have, this iOS 7, which is quite a lot different, but on the same hardware. Yeah, so I'm sort of expecting new hardware to, when they release, because they haven't released it. It's no. a beta. They haven't released it. So they haven't actually said that. So they could actually surprise everybody and say, look, here's a new iPhone. I, I seriously doubt this, but they could say, here's a radically new iPhone, the iPhone 6, and not a point release, a full version release, iOS 6, uh, no, rather iPhone 6 phone with the iOS 7 software. And uh, heck, we'll throw in a brand new low-cost iPhone as well. All the rest of it. Maybe they'll do that. Yeah, and that would be I, more I, I consistently do. pure. Well, maybe they would, actually, because they did that with the iPhone. But generally... Oh, not the iPhone, the, the iPod. They had the iPhone, the iPod Nano, um, which was a kind of budget... But I, I generally think <coughs> it's great that flattening it out, but I would, in, in terms of functionality, I would prefer a greater, uh, greater density of information as well to have a, a huge big calendar icon that just says the same amount of information you know monday the 10th i would want a little bit more information inside that icon there's a lot of space there and do we really need that much space i mean you know i really do it doesn't take me long to to take in all of that information so you know maybe a greater density of information you know a big musical you know note on a icon it's, it's huge doesn't need to be that big. I don't think. Obviously, the icon may need to be that big in order for a touch target for your fat fingers. But yeah. No, the, about, in terms of information, with we, anything we, just we said, could really. put a little bit more information on there, couldn't we? Maybe it's minimal. It doesn't need it. Music is a you know or whatever that is. Um, um. But yeah, I think I think it's it's a bold. A bold yes. Departure. But I, I think uh, we'll, we'll leave leave that there. Yes. Um, we've we've spoken about hardware. And again, they're 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 moving along in the design stakes. There's a, quite a lot of re, there's a retro aspect to the new Mac Pro in that it's very small and it's going to be on the desktop and it's it's quite funky. Uh, retro, it, I don't follow re, you. Retro in terms of the idea of it sounds like the cube that they brought out, which was just this. It's a sculpture. It's an absolute thing of beauty that's going to sit right on your desk, right next to your monitor. It's not going to make any sound because there are no moving parts. I don't believe there was a fan in the original cube, but this one does have a fan. 
Yeah, it must have a fan. No, it does. It does have a fan. It right. absolutely has a fan in the top, and it's got a central chimney to push all the heat out. Yeah. So it'll be on your desk, but it's going to have to be pretty darn silent. because there's Smokestack not, on there's, your desk. There's not much else making that much noise on a modern desktop. I mean, you know, your monitor no longer makes any sort of buzz or any kind of noise. It's completely quiet. And uh, we've all moved away from the big clicky keyboards and we're all on the whole chiclet style yeah well that that sucks i mean that's apple telling me that um uh this is the way keyboards should be they're like laptop keyboards and i really miss the whole clunky uh big clicky keyboards of old in fact at home i I do have a beautiful apple i can't remember what it's called but the oh it's a proper mac extended keyboard with the black keys and the big clicky keys and it's beautiful to type on when i'm at work i have one of these horrible chiclet style island what does chiclet keys. mean chiclet that's a, a bad a bad definition of that sort of keyboard a chiclet is a is an american bubblegum product and Chic- it's a hard, chiclet is what you call it's a hard shelled books for women sweet. it's like a pejorative oh chiclet yeah All right but chiclet c-h-i-c-k-l-e-t is a brand of gum right and it the little, they look like buttons. They're little hard-shelled chewing gum things. Did you make that up? No, I'm fairly sure that's where it comes from. Okay. But it'd be more accurate and more universal to say it's an island-style keys that have space around them. Right. And I find them easier to hit. I much prefer them. I oh, really I hate I'm them. A fan. I mean, they're easier to clean. Yeah, I'm definitely... A f- it, they absolutely are. Because they depress as you, you can wipe the keyboard. Yes. I, 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 I tipped over my I, keyboard the other day. I'm a, should, I've been completely... You should have seen what came out of it. No, I would rather not. So I think, to finish up, I think it would be remiss of us not to mention the retail experience of Apple and the fact that they have hundreds of shops. They have their own stores worldwide. And in London, where we are based, just down the road, in fact, there are two huge cathedral-style retail experiences for Apple. Now, I don't know what your experience is of uh, the stores and buying things in the stores, but I don't particularly buy many Apple products, but I have bought Apple products from Apple stores, and I think it's great. I think it's clean, it's attractive, it's clutter-free, it's logically laid out, and there are many, many people on hand who want to help you. It's not at all difficult to get help when you need it. I guess this comes under the... um heading of design, I suppose, was that it is, they, they are designed, these stores. Well, Steve Jobs agonized over the design of the stores. He yes. spent months and months and months, and in fact, he radically changed his uh, his whole idea about the stores. To, they, he was ready to launch the stores and had to delay them for months and months and months when a colleague told him, you know what, maybe we shouldn't arrange the store around the products, but arrange the store around the activities like movies and music and he said yeah right. you're right which is rare for him and had to remodel all the shops and the prototype and okay experience. anyway uh with my own experience of the apple stores um and i had a very nice experience there i had a wonderful apple experience i uh well no i didn't in terms of the reason why i went in there is because my iphone was broken um but in terms of how they dealt with that it was fantastic i went in there i did it, there was oh no wait a minute what did i do no i made an appointment with the Genius Bar, which is easy enough to do online. Strolled in there, and uh, I didn't have to... Which one? Which branch? This Regent Street. Regent Street. Um, and uh, lots of smiley faces. Um, but what about the design? What about the well, building? Well, this, this is the thing. I mean, you walk in, and it's palatial. It's Plenty uh, of space. Plenty of air. And also, we should mention how you, you can stroll up to any you know iPad or iMac or whatever and immediately be fully online use it. yeah, it's fully used fully, it's fully not usable. locked like yeah. any other yeah. everywhere else basically yeah. um, and it's they make a big deal about not hating going into one of their stores anyway so I went up the stairs it seemed like ascending staircase. into heaven <laughs> yeah it was indeed um, some guy Gabriel. Met, met me at the top and he really went out of his way to be as helpful as he could and he did absolutely everything he, he took me by the hand all of this amazing stuff. Um, let me use the toilet. Uh, and uh, in the end, he decided, yes, my iPhone was broken. Um, and he gave me another one. He gave me another iPhone. That's amazing. Yeah. He really gave you another one. That's incredible. <laughs> Only for £120. Oh, I see. It was a reconditioned uh, unit, but it had no scratches on it. So it only took me a couple of weeks before I started dropping it and scratching it. But it was broken, the phone. It wasn't just scratched. 
My one. Yes. It was broken. It was, it, broken. It was actually broken. Yeah. It, it was. It was the most frustrating kind of uh, break. I'm not sure whether or not this comes under the rubric of this show. Um, it's is that the right word? No. But continue. Right, well, I'm going to cut that out. I'm going to start that again. Yes, it was broken. Um, it uh, had the most frustrating fault uh, where I'd be speaking to someone and they'd be saying things like, hello, is that Ben? And then they'd go, hello, 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 and then hang up. Could be your network provider. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But in terms of design, the experience I have had with the stores, again, design space, space and, you know, white space and blank and I love all that. I'm certainly a minimalist when it comes to actual space. And you are able to walk in. There are no heavy doors that you cannot push open. You can literally walk in to an Apple store, which is quite rare. Because most stores have the, you know, we don't want children running out into the street type really heavy doors. You can just walk in, use their toilet, yeah, you check walk, your email and walk out yeah, again. you can walk in and you can, you know, properly give their products a go in, in, in categories of activities. So if you want, if you're interested in music... They will have a Mac that's hooked up to a keyboard. So, you know, it's not just the computer you're using. You can actually really properly give the go. You can do some work. Yeah, you can actually go in there and, yeah, they only need to do coffee. That's probably the only thing they're not doing. But little things that I noticed kind of bug me. I think the glass staircase is kind of gaudy. But what? it's kind of gaudy. It's a glass staircase. It's kind of gaudy. And things like the flag yeah, that's hanging outside. Yeah, but I you're searching for things to have a well, problem no, with. I suppose. But, you know, they agonize over um, their design. So I'm going to agonize over criticizing their design. Yeah, but for instance, the flag that's hanging outside is wrong. It seems so innocuous. The, the flag is wrong. What is the it's, flag? It's just wrong and uncomfortable looking. Well, the Regent Street store, for example. Oh, it's got a white flag with a no, black. No, it has a black flag with a white, with the white yeah. apple thingy thingy. Yeah. But it's it's cut at an angle, the flag. Right. It's not hanging. A flag would be almost furled hanging at that angle on the flag. Oh, pole. I see. Yeah, but yeah. They've, they've cut, trimmed the flag, so it's, yeah, it brilliant. Just, it's, well, not, it's not a rectangle. Noise yeah, well, that's an inherent design flaw of flags. But, yeah, there you go. Then they've corrected it. Mm. So, fair enough. They want to hang it at that angle. Um, the furniture, uh, I mean, this is a functional point, but in the Covent Garden branch, there's a huge atrium with an unbelievable amount of glass above you, and it's directly above the tablet computers, which you look at, typically, you're looking down at the tablet computers. So, because everything has a sh- has, must have a shiny screen these days. Well, we should put that even though, under... Even though they've damped... Dampened. No, the they haven't. No, bit. we Especially should. No, hang on. No, we should definitely mention this, and this should really be in under the dumb design. And it's how Apple products. If I'm uh, watching a movie on my uh, MacBook Pro, for example, you like, think you're in the movie. Well, that, that's it. It's like you're watching, um, you know, whatever's going on on the screen. But if if the scene turns to black, it's like suddenly there I am. Well, this is a point. This is a, po- a technological point, which really doesn't fall under the topic of the program. The rubric. But, yes. Um, it doesn't fall under the topic. It's slightly off topic, but the point of having a glossy screen is that it's reflecting all of the light in fewer directions, therefore giving you more of the vibrance and the colors mm, and the blackness. Whereas if you have a non shiny screen, like this computer monitor we're looking at at the moment, on the face of it, you would think, well, I cannot see my face in it. But in fact, in, in fact, the the colors are more washed out because it's reflecting light in more directions. Yes. But there, again, it swings around about. Yeah. If you're working on a laptop with a glossy screen, it's, there's a lot of lighting in the room and someone walks by and vibrates the table. Suddenly you're aware, you're refocusing your eyes, seeing mm. your own face yeah. because you've just wobbled the... What can you do? The same, but they're getting yeah. better at it and they're reducing the direct reflection. In the you know, I think it's an optional extra. I seem to recall that when I bought a MacBook Pro... Uh, I you're going spent... back to the Titanium days, I think. Whenever my one was, which I think was 2010, okay. they said... You, oh, could, you for, could order it with Yeah, them. for an extra £30. Pounds. They've, they've given up on that. Uh-huh. I think it's because they've, they've reduced the amount of direct reflection available. Moving on, I think uh, the future of Apple, and then we'll call it a day. What's going to happen now? We've already discussed the possibility of releasing a the new backlash. phone. Uh, they will continue releasing models, and they seem to do it every year. When you're at the shop, there's only one direction you can go. Well, that's what they say, and it's what happened to Microsoft. Uh, it was a, a monopoly, and if and you're a monopoly, you don't, you don't want things to change when you're at the top, because the only change is going to be bad. Yeah, I'd be surprised Stay if that on top. to Apple, though, because no, that would be against everything Apple stands they, they for. They seem to be so far away from the other manufacturers. I'm like, occasionally, I get excited with a new release from HTC in the mobile scene or Samsung, when the desktop scene, um, you know, Asus might release a really nice MacBook Air clone 
but it, you know it's really fabulous and it has interesting technology and even microsoft can release hardware that you think hey you know what maybe touch on a laptop could actually work mm. but then you look at apple and you think wow they're so far ahead it's it's crazy and they're so far ahead because they they don't clutter things up. They, mm. They're very clean, nice designs, even though you pay a premium. But you think, what would I rather be using? I'd mm. rather be using the beautiful, simplistic, and yet robust design of an Apple product than uh, struggling away, decrapifying something It's again, it, It's worth coming back to that, because we kind of said that at the beginning of the show. And I think that is Apple. You don't mind paying the premium, because it's such a wonderful experience. Yeah, they compel you to pay a little bit more money yeah. for a better experience. Um, and again, I mean, this is my own theory, that... Um, Bill Gates and the Apple, uh, I know we shouldn't talk about this, but the Windows people made a big deal about their philanthropy. <laughs> uh, is that the right word? Philanthropy, yeah. They yeah. are philanthropists. Sorry, sure. my, my brain is fading. And I think it's guilt about um, forcing everyone to use these horrible products, whereas Apple don't really feel that guilt because they've given us these amazing products and we're happy about that. Well, I think um, Steve Jobs was asked about his lack, well, his relative lack of philanthropy, given the, the amount of money he had, right? Uh, but he his response was, you know, he really hasn't decided or, or worked out precisely the best way in which to spend the money, and I think that's fair enough because you should have so said to him, "You can't take it with so, you, Steve." So many good causes are, you know, are are hampered by corruption in the background. It's just terrible, but that's for another. Podcast. That's for another podcast. I think yeah. uh, I think we'll leave it there. I think we've left a lot of things uh, unsaid. Uh, we skipped around uh, and the over the d- desktop software um we should really give that a, another look in and we can because this is eclecticist uh, .co.uk podcast we can hit any subject at any time in any way and just have a discussion at any part of the world it can be done and uh, of course uh, we are open to suggestions please visit the website eclecticist.co.uk uh, there's a contact form you can pop in some details or, or no details um we don't validate and uh, give us some suggestions. Tell me what you think. Us what you think, well, rather. Yeah. And uh, we will try and publish your comments if they're publishable. We'll take your comments on board. And uh, we're keen to have topics to talk about. And uh, Be nice. who knows okay. where we'll go. Maybe we'll have a, a chat room. and Maybe we have some more feedback, more interaction in the future. But this is the inaugural podcast. We do have a lot to talk about. There are a lot of topics in the pipeline. We will be back very shortly. And uh, thank you very much for listening. We have not yet decided what our next show is going to be about, but if you go to the website, you'll see the list of uh, possibilities. Um, some are probably more popular than others, I think. Some are definitely uh, quite big at the moment, like uh, talking about um, new atheism. You know, there's going to be a lot of mileage in that, a lot of views. Uh, and moral objectivism, which I'm sure uh, that will interest no one. <laughs> The fade-out music, uh, which you're about to hear, uh, is something chosen by Jeff. Yes, it's a a very interesting song. It's a track called Black Swan. It's by Texas Radio Fish. It features Kay Furious. I love him. And uh, she is really excellent. Uh, It's it's completely open-source music, and I think it's put together exceedingly well.